Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're in the world. Welcome to our webinar, Elevate Performance Using the Capital Asset Pricing Model, brought to you by the ARC Consortium. The ARC Consortium works with and supports key organizations developing our software um, through grants and sponsorships worldwide. Please visit our website to learn all the details on how your organization can become a member. Um, my name is Elena Quintero, today's announcers, and I just have a few uh, housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar will be like an interactive Q&A section between you and our presenter. Just type in a question into her, the questions window at any point during the presentation and click the submit button near the end of the when near the end of the webinar we'll try to answer as many of your questions as time allows. All right, so let's get started. This webinar focuses on elevate performance using the capital asset pricing model. Christoph is an independent data scientist um, and business intelligence expert. He co-created and maintains the Tidy Finance Project, a transparent open source approach to research in financial economics. Christoph, thank you so much. And you can go ahead and begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Elenia, and thank you to the R Consortium for having us again. So this is the second installment of a webinar series that we're given. Um, and actually the stuff that I'm presenting today builds on um, the webinar that we have uh, given a month ago. So the last webinar focused on modern portfolio theory. In particular, we looked at the Markowitz model, which is very influential in financial economics. And the main argument uh, that Markowitz brought forth is that you should focus on diversification to minimize risk to achieve a specific target return. So I encourage you to look at the slides and the recordings of the previous webinar, and you also already find the slides of the current webinar uh, under the domain talks.tidyfinance.org. In today's webinar, we talk about the capital as a pricing model. This is a cornerstone of financial economics, and the key questions that this model it wants to answer is what is the expected return of an asset? And second, which portfolios should investors hold? And to answer these questions, the uh, CAP M um, focuses on an, is an equilibrium model and it extends the modern portfolio theory brought forth by Markowitz by including systematic risk. And crucially, instead of having a single investor that tries to optimize his or her uh, personal investment. In the cap M, there are actually uh, a lot of rational uh, investors that uh, invest together. And this model was invented simultaneously by uh, three uh, researchers independently in the early 60s. So Bill Sharp, uh, Lindner, and Mossin uh, published uh, papers in different journals that, that uh, formalized the idea behind the CAPM. And just to preview the CAPM in a nutshell, um, the idea is that investors demand a compensation for risk. And as a result, the expected return of individual assets can be described uh, as the sum of a risk-free return that can be earned and the compensation for the market risk. So we will provide much more details throughout this presentation, but just to give you a short preview, the risk-free rate is just a return on investment without risk. So typically government bonds or more specifically uh, T-bills in the United States. And market risk, the idea behind this is that you want to capture how much asset returns co-move with the overall market. So what we will do in this webinar is um, follow these six steps. First, we will calculate asset returns and volatility. So this follows very much the stuff that uh, we've discussed in the previous webinar. We will look at the risk-free rate and talk about an uh, important another important concept in finance, which is the Sharpe ratio. 
Then we will call, calculate the so-called tangency portfolio, plot the capital market line. And where it gets really interesting is when we estimate asset betas and use the CAPM to evaluate asset performance towards the end of the webinar. Now let's get started with code and data as quickly as possible. So this webinar builds on daily stock data from the Dow Industrial Average for the last five years. So the packages that I'm, the main packages that I'm using are the Tidyverse and the Tidy Finance package. And we use the Tidy Finance package to download the index constituents from the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So these are 30 stocks. And then we also use the tidy finance package to download daily stock prices for the last five years. And just to give you an idea how the data looks like. So we have a data frame with the column symbol, date, and price, which refer to closing prices. Now we use these daily prices to calculate daily returns. So simply for each symbol, we calculate uh, raw returns, so prices dividing them by leg prices minus one. And to look at the data now, so we have again, symbol column, the date column, and a red column, which refers to return. And also something that we've done in the last webinar, we plot risk and return measures. And in particular, for each symbol, we calculate the expected return mu, which is just the mean of the historical daily returns, and sigma, which is the standard deviation of these individual returns. So now we create a scatter plot by putting the sigma on the x-axis and the expected return mu on the y-axis. And this is what this scatter plot looks like. So you see that on the x-axis, uh, the volatility on the far right, there is a stock called BA uh, with the symbol BA. This is actually Boeing. So this is a stock that has a high volatility, but very low average return. And on the top of the figure, you can see that the stock with the highest average return uh, is actually Apple with the symbol AAPL. And this plot introduces the main question. So why does high, does high risk necessarily lead to high returns? And Boeing and Apple are very good examples. And the answer is that actually, so company specific events are very important because they have, might affect the stock prices. So for instance, CEO resignation, product launch or earnings reports. And I think for Boeing, um, this was a lot on the news over the last couple of years for various reasons. And these idiosyncratic events don't impact uh, the overall market. And as we have discussed in the previous webinar, this as a specific risk, which is idiosyncratic, can be eliminated through diversification. So what we'll, do, we'll focus on in, in this webinar is now systematic risk that affects all assets in the market. And then the question, how does each asset co-move with the market? And the underlying assumption and the most simple uh, uh, way is that investors dislike risk. And in the CAPM model, as I've said already before, just to emphasize this, there are these different sources of risk. So systematic risk means all assets are exposed to it and this cannot be diversified away. And it is a credit risk. It is really unique to particular assets and this can be diversified away. Let's introduce a bit of notation because we want to uh, um, formalize this notion of systematic risk. So building on the notation from the last webinar, we will use uh, portfolio returns and variants. So the expected portfolio return is the uh, result of a multiplication of omega times mu, where omega is a vector of asset weights and mu is a vector, vector of expected returns of assets. And the portfolio variance, which measures, measures, measures our risk, um, is 
um, the result of, uh, of omega prime times sigma times omega, where the big sigma refers to the variance covariance matrix. Again, if this is very new to you, then I encourage you to look at the previous webinar where uh, I provide a much more detailed introduction into portfolio returns and um, risk measure. Now, we just, so far we only discussed uh, risky assets. So these individual stocks of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, the innovation, one part of the innovation from the CAPM comes from the introduction of a risk-free asset. Now, what we have is uh, a new portfolio that combines the risk, uh, portfolio of the risky assets and the risk-free asset. And I will, I will provide more details on the risk-free um, asset in, in a minute. And we can describe this mixed portfolio as a linear combination of the uh, expected return of the risky portfolio. So this means C times omega mu plus one minus C uh, times the risk-free rate. And this gives us our combined portfolio return mu C. And of course, this fraction C uh, here uh, really just tells you how much do you put into the risky portfolio. And this um, combined portfolio allows us to introduce the first very important concept, the so-called capital allocation line. So the risk-free asset as the name already suggests, there's no risk. So this means it has zero volatility, which is our main measure of risk for this application. So this also means that the portfolio risk of the combined portfolio is just measured by the volatility of uh, the risky asset portfolio. And in mathematical terms, uh, this means that the portfolio risk sigma C can be expressed as a fraction of the volatility of the risky portfolio. So it's just T, C times the square root of omega prime times sigma times omega. And this allows us to solve for C. And we can plug this in uh, into the equation on the previous slide. And now we have this capital allocation line. So this describes the expected return of the combined portfolio as the sum of the risk-free return plus the risk times this ratio um, that where on the top you have the expected returns, uh, expected excess returns of the risky uh, portfolio normalized by the volatility of the uh, risky portfolio. And this part is actually a very important concept. It is the so-called sharp ratio. So again, in this ratio at the top, you have the expected excess returns. So risky assets minus risk-free rate normalized by the risk of the uh, risky asset portfolio. And this is a very convenient measure because it, it measures the excess return per unit of risk. And the interpretation is also very handy because it means that a higher ratio indicates a more attractive uh, risk-adjusted return. So what we'll do next is um, take a couple of example portfolios and calculate this capital allocation line. To do this, we have to calculate the sharp ratio for these portfolios. But first, we need the risk-free rate because so far we have only downloaded the risky asset return. I use uh, for this uh, application now, I use the 13 week T-bill rate um, that you can also download using the tidy finance package. So it has the symbol uh, IRX um, and it is quoted in annualized percentage yields. So we have to convert it a bit so we have to uh, take this adjusted close price divided by 100 and then uh, uh, create a daily rate out of this annualized rate. 
So this is what it looks like, which is the date and a risk-free rate for each uh, day. Now let's create a couple of example portfolios. Again, building on the previous webinar. So we have already calculated the individual asset mu's, so the average uh, returns of each asset. And in lines two to five, you see that we're also calculating the covariance, uh, the variance covariance matrix. And to create a couple of example portfolios, just one very common portfolio is a portfolio with equal weight. So each asset receives a certain share uh, of the uh, total portfolio weight. And um, so I'm using just the number of assets here uh, as a parameter and the omega, so the weight for the equal weight, omega EW is just one divided by the number of assets for each asset. Again, reusing something from the last webinar, we can calculate for each of these portfolios, the, the portfolio return and the portfolio uh, sigma, and I'm calling this uh, equal weighted portfolio. Just to get another portfolio in there, let's use some random weights. Um, and now the omega random, so I'm setting a seed here to, to get uh, replicable uh, results. Um, and I'm just drawing random numbers between minus one and one. So as you might remember from the last webinar, weights can also be negative because we allow uh, short selling. Uh, and then I make sure that these weights sum up to one by dividing this omega random uh, through the sum of uh, all of these weights. And again, the same uh, calculation from mu and sigma just using different weights. And I call this a portfolio randomly weighted portfolio. Since I want to plot these different portfolios and the different capital allocation lines, uh, we also need the risk-free rate. Here it's very simple, the risk-free rate uh, we can also calculate a mu as the average uh, daily risk-free rate. The sigma is just zero because we assume that it has no volatility and we call this a uh, risk-free rate. So this is what we get then in the end, um, three rows for uh, equal weighted portfolio, randomly weighted portfolio and the risk-free asset. Each of them has a mu and a sigma. And we want to plot this now. Remember, very important feed, um, component of the capital allocation line is the Sharpe ratio. So I'm introducing a helper function here. It's called calculate Sharpe ratio, and it does exactly what we have described before. So it calculates the ratio between the expected excess return. So it's mu minus risk-free rate, and it divides it by sigma. And we're doing this actually for all, uh, for those two portfolios. So I'm using the string detect function and then type column to look for the portfolio uh, um, text in this column. And so for these two portfolios that we have calculated, we, we calculate the Sharpe ratio. And now we will basically reuse the existing plot, but by, by putting the volatility in the x-axis and the expected return on the y-axis. But now I'm adding these capital allocation lines where the intercept is always the risk-free rate and the slope are the sharp ratios for these different portfolios. And this is what it looks like. So the points again correspond to the individual assets um, just as before. I removed the labels for Apple and uh, Boeing for now. And the crosses correspond to the portfolios. So you see that the red line goes through the risk-free asset and the equal weighted portfolio. And the green line goes through the risk-free asset and the randomly weighted portfolio. Just by pure chance, I did not think about it much, but the randomly weighted portfolio actually yields a better risk return trade-off than the equal weighted portfolio in this application. Um, but as you can see, there are still assets that perform that are above 
these lines. So this means that the individual assets in particular, if you look at Apple, which is uh, at the top here, um, it's actually better than those ran than any combination between this randomly weighted portfolio and the risk-free asset or any combination between the equal weighted portfolio and the risk-free asset. So this naturally leads to the question, what is the, what are the best possible combinations that we uh, can get in this setting? And this brings us to the so-called tangency portfolio. The tangency portfolio is the portfolio that maximizes the Sharpe ratio. Again, as I said before, it's a very important concept. It's the ratio between the expected excess returns uh, relative to the uh, risk of the portfolio. And similar to the Markowitz optimization problem from the previous webinar, here we're looking for uh, portfolio weights that maximize this ratio while staying fully invested. So this means that um, um, the, the sum of all portfolio weights equals one. And this tangency portfolio uh, actually has an analytic solution. I provide a link to the details uh, here on the slide. Um, so the tangency weight are just this um, expression here where you have the inverse of the variance covariance matrix, again, a concept from the previous uh, webinar. And we can calculate it uh, by just implementing this uh, analytic solution in R. So now we also want to plot this uh, uh, tangency portfolio, in particular, we want to plot the capital allocation line with this uh, tangency portfolio. And so we have to compute the same uh, things that we have computed before. So for the tangency portfolio, we want to have an expected portfolio return, uh, uh, volatility sigma. We had this, the type uh, that describes the tangency portfolio, we calculate the Sharpe ratio and we add a value for the risk-free rate. And in particular, so this is a very important concept, the, the, the capital allocation line for the tangency portfolio, because this is what we call actually the capital market line. So this is the combination of the risk-free rate and the tangency portfolio. So as you can see here in this expression at the top, we have the combined portfolio return mu C, which is sum of the risk-free rate, which is the intercept of these lines that we've we will look uh, we've looked at before, um, and the slope here is given by the the sharp ratio of the tangency portfolio, and this capital market line describes the best risk return trade-off for portfolios that contain the risk-free asset and uh, the tangency portfolio. So let's take a look at the figure now. And as you can see here, now the purple line is just added uh, to the to the to the green and the red line that we had before, and the purple line goes through the intercept, the risk-free rate, as the other lines, and the tangency portfolio is on the far right uh, coin. So as you can see, at the tangency portfolio, uh, in terms of expected uh, returns and volatility, exceeds all other portfolios. But actually, the whole line describes. Uh, um, efficient allocation so that investors can really pick any of these combinations between the risk-free rate and the tangency portfolio and they get uh, uh, superior returns to holding the individual assets or any other portfolio. And this is actually a very important argument that the cap M makes. Because in the cap M, so in the Markowitz world, there was, we looked at the single investor and the capital allocation program, but in the cap, in the, in the cap M model, we look at uh, many investors and what, what they think, what they are doing and what they decide is best. And in fact, they, as investors prefer to hold any portfolio in the capital market line overholding individual assets or any other portfolio. But as you've seen visually, this, the capital market line, the purple line was above all the other lines or the individual assets. And this is a very um, 
important because we can use this capital uh, market line to describe the return of individual assets uh, because they can really be compared to the efficient uh, pensioncy weights. And in fact, as the CAPM shows, the risk of an asset is proportional to the covariance with the tenancy portfolio weight. Now let's go back to the, the, uh, from the, the sharp ratio expression that we had before and reformulate a bit. And we can now uh, describe the expected excess return of an individual asset really as Adams have stated before, the, the beta times uh, the excess return of the tangency portfolio, where the beta now is the ratio of the covariance between individual asset returns and the tangency portfolio returns um, normalized by the uh, variance of the tangency portfolio return. And this asset beta is a very important concept. But then again, as you see, this, this directly relates to the sharp ratio that we have uh, discussed before. Now let's calculate uh, excess returns because this is what we I want to look at next. So what we're doing is um, um, so we are creating a new data frame with the tangency weights. So we have a column with the symbol and uh, this um, the tangency weights that we have uh, computed before with using this analytic solution. And then we can calculate the returns of the tangency portfolio on a daily basis by uh, using our daily returns and joining the tangency weights. And then for each date, we compute the weighted uh, mean of this um, across the symbols using these omega, omega tangency weights as weights. And we get uh, now uh, what we call a market return uh, going forward. And what we want to have is an excess for uh, a re excess return for the individual assets. So we're taking the um, so we subtract the risk-free rate from the individual asset return and we calculate the market excess return by subtracting the, the risk-free rate from the market return. Let's just take, let's take a look at the resulting data. So we have a column, a symbol column as before. Uh, for, and for each individual date, we have now an, market an, an asset uh, excess return and a market access return that is the same for uh, each asset uh, on a particular date. And now let's estimate those asset beaters uh, because as we have seen before on the left-hand side, we have uh, access returns of the individual assets. On the right-hand side, we have uh, the market access returns um, with the coefficient beta. So we can just run a linear regression and creating a little, little helper function here that just uh, fits the, the, uh, this model to the data and extracts the coefficients. So this is this estimate beta function that you see in the first couple of rows. And then to calculate the beta for each asset, I use the nest function to uh, create a, a data a column for each symbol. And then I can map the estimate beta function across uh, these individual symbols. So this is what the data looks like. So now we have only 30 rows because each symbol has a data column that contains a nested table and then a value of beta because in this regression, the only value that uh, my function returns is actually the coefficient for, for beta. Now let's plot those asset beaters. So um, now on the x-axis, I will plot the beaters. Um, and on the y-axis, we will sort the assets by individual beaters. So for these 30 stocks, this is what we get. 
you see that on the top, um, Apple has the highest asset beta. So this means that Apple has the highest co-movement uh, with, with the market. And on the bottom, you see that BA uh, symbol, so Boeing has the lowest and in particular also has a negative uh, beta with the market. So this means when the market excess returns go up, then the Boeing uh, returns tend to go down, at least in this five-year period that I'm uh, uh, looking at. And this makes a lot of sense because uh, markets have been going up uh, over the last couple of years, but Boeing has had a lot of trouble. Uh, and so it did not really, so it's a lot of idiosyncratic stuff going on. So it did not go move with the market too much. So even more interesting, I guess what we what we want to see is how does how do asset returns relate to this systematic risk? Now, um, what we want to do is at the x-axis again we we look at the asset beta that we've just estimated, and on the y-axis we will add the excess returns uh, from mu, and then I will plot uh, a forty-five degree line. And this is one of the key results of the of the, um, the cap M that you have all these assets fall uh, on this uh, forty five degree line because each asset exactly gets uh, the mass, uh, this this um, compensation for risk that um, it should. So on the top you have Apple, which has the highest beta and hence also returns gets the, the highest return and and, and the um, bottom left you have Boeing with the negative asset beta and a low uh, average uh, return. So this cap this is the one of the key results in the cap M. So this is really the assets, uh, the investors demand the compensation for this systematic risk. So this is why all these assets also fall onto this uh, line. But this is a textbook case. Um, and this tangency portfolio is very simple in the setting because I only have five years of data and uh, just 30 assets. And so we can very quickly compute the uh, um, average returns and the variance covariance matrix. But there are two important problems in practice. First, what is the correct asset universe? That's obviously our 30 assets that we used so far is probably not does not represent the market too well um, and second how do you estimate this mu and the sigmas for many many assets and maybe a lot of different uh, data uh, problems that might arise and the very cool thing about the capital asset pricing model is that it um, argues that the market portfolio is actually equal to the tangency portfolio and there are a couple of assumptions behind this uh, result that I will give you in a minute. But this result is very cool because we can skip this calculation of the tangency portfolio weights and just use uh, portfolios that are weighted by market capitalization. And there's a lot of data out there and it's very easy also to calculate, fairly easy to calculate it. So the assumptions, um, so this is not a theory webinar, so I'm, it's very superficial view. Um, but the assumptions behind this are that this is an equilibrium model in a single period economy. Equilibrium model means that supply and, uh, will equal uh, demand. Um, there are no transaction costs or taxes and the risk-free borrowing and lending uh, available to all investors. Um, and these investors, they are rational and share uh, the same expectations and they follow Markowitz in maximizing returns for a limited level of risk. It is it's a fairly simple model, but the cap M is a foundation for a lot of other uh, models in financial economics because of its simplicity. And there are a lot of papers that try to relax different type, different uh, sets of assumptions uh, and, and, and to get, also find very similar uh, predictions. Now, we, we will reuse this uh, the capital market line now, uh, this concept to introduce the security market line. So now we can describe the expected return of an asset as we had it 
uh, similar to what we had it before. So on the left hand side, you have the uh, mu i, so the expected return of a particular asset i. And this can be described as the sum of the risk free rate plus the asset beta times mu m. Mu m now refers to the uh, expected market return. So before we had the portfolio, uh, tangency portfolio uh, return, but now because these cap m assumptions lead to the conclusion that the tangency portfolio is the market portfolio we can use the market uh, returns here. And now this beta i uh, becomes the ratio of the covariance of the asset i with the market divided by the market uh, volatility squared. And the security market line is very neat because we can also use it uh, to introduce this concept of alpha and to evaluate the performance of individual assets. And in particular, if we rearrange a bit, so we move the risk-free rate to the left-hand side um, and introduce uh, alpha on the right-hand side. So we have on the left-hand side the, the risk, um, the, the uh, expected excess returns of the asset. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, the alpha, which is uh, now potentially an intercept for the individual asset plus the uh, now familiar expression of beta times the expected uh, market access return. So if this alpha really exists for a, a particular asset, it means that this, this asset yields um, an outperformance or an underperformance relative to the market. If this, S, if this alpha is zero, then there is no outperformance or underperformance. And this is a very uh, nice result. Um, and we can interpret this alpha as the performance adjusted for market risk. So this is what we do a lot in practice, is that for individual assets, we estimate the betas and we sometimes also want to figure out whether there is an uh, alpha that is relevant. Um, we can do this for individual stocks or we can do this for mutual funds uh, or for hedge funds or for other types of assets. So again, positive alpha means outperformance relative to the market because now this, this, this intercept is significantly positive and a negative alpha means underperformance relative to the market because success returns are on average uh, negative without taking uh, the core movement with the market into account. Now let's bring this to the data. We want to estimate asset uh, alphas and betas and similar to before, so we re use a regression model. Now I have to uh, change the notation a bit because um, on the left-hand side, we have the actual returns of asset i on day t. So we are really looking at the individual uh, time periods here. Um, and alpha i is constant uh, across time. It gets a hat because this is an estimated quantity. The same for beta uh, hat, which is also estimated. And on the right-hand side, side, you have a uh, typical uh, for re regression models, an error term. Now, Estimating this model, there are many ways to do it actually because it depends on how much uh, data you throw uh, into it. Um, but first, before we can estimate it, we need to get uh, a measure for uh, market returns. Again, we we'll skip this whole tangency portfolio stuff. Um, and even so, in the tangency portfolio world, we had this result that all the assets fall into the uh, onto this the line anyway, and there are no alphas. And the typical measure for market access returns comes from uh, a data source called um, farm and French factors. You can also use the tidy finance package to download this data for the time period we're looking at. And this is what we get. So now there's a date. Farm and French provides the market access returns, and they also provide a risk free rate, which is. 99% correlated to the risk free rate that we have uh, used before based on uh, the 13 week T bill rate. Now, to estimate these alphas and betas, 
So we are adding these factors to our daily returns, calculate now uh, again the excess returns by subtracting the risk rate from the individual asset returns. And now we have to extend the estimate beta's function a bit and I'm creating a new function called estimate cap m. And this now regresses the uh, excess returns of individual assets on the market excess returns. And as you can see here, um, there's also an intercept in this regression because the intercept will describe uh, the alpha. And now instead of just extracting the beta coefficient, we are extracting the alpha, the beta uh, estimates and the T statistics. Similar to before, we nest by symbol. So um, we can also then map this estimate cap M function across uh, the different uh, symbols. So what we get in the end now uh, is a symbol column. So we have two rows for each symbol. We have an alpha and a beta, an estimate and a T statistic. Let's plot these asset alphas. So, so once we take out the uh, systematic risk from the, um, uh, that is captured by beta, what is left are the asset alphas, so this individual intercepts. As you can see in this plot, the apple is at the top again uh, because it has a, a positive alpha of, of more than 0.05% uh, uh, per day, but it is not statistically significant at the 95% level because the T statistic is too low. Similarly for uh, Boeing, this is, it has a negative uh, alpha, but it is not statistically significant. So this means that neither, so none of these assets actually yield to statistically significant outperformance or underperformance relative to the market uh, as provided by the Pharma French library. And you can redo this exercise with many different assets or different uh, measures of the market and check whether uh, assets have an alpha or not. And this brings us actually to very popular shortcomings of the CAPM. It is, I, I think it's impossible to create a universal measure for a market because it really depends on the context. If you're a US investor heavily based in uh, with your investment or your consumption in the American stock uh, economy, then the S&P 500 might be a good measure for you if you're a German investor in the DAX or if you're in Japan, maybe the Topics Index. So there are different measures for market. If you're a very global investor, you might consider the MSCI World Index. That's one point. Another popular shortcoming is that this beta might not be stable over time. So what we have done now is just estimate one uh, alpha and one beta for each symbol over this whole five-year period. But whether an asset co-moves with the market or not might change uh, over time substantially because company operations or the competitive uh, environment affect this beta. And thirdly, I want to highlight that so far we only have looked at systematic risk, so the exposure to the market, but this might not be the only factor. In particular, the CAPM shows very poor performance uh, when, when uh, explaining small cap or high growth returns in the data. And there are many more. So the CAPM has been around for a long time. So people came up with many more uh, shortcomings. I just want to mention that behavioral biases can, uh, of course, uh, be very important or heterogeneous preferences, liquidity constraints and stuff like that. So to uh, arrive at, to, at the end of this uh, webinar, I just want to highlight that the cap M is very important as, as, as a foundation, but there are very popular uh, alternative and extensions. And I also provide a couple of links. Um, most importantly, the Pharma French three factor model extends the cap M into two very, uh, very important dimensions. Uh, it looks at the outperformance of small versus big companies. So here uh, you see a link to tidyfinance.org because we have a whole chapter on uh, this uh, size premium. And the second extension of the far French effect, three factor model is the outperformance of high versus low value companies. And there's also a separate chapter in at tidyfinance.org. 
that's Pharma and French. They came up even with a three-factor model, uh, a five-factor model by extending the three factors. We uh, have a chapter where we replicate all five uh, factors in uh, our uh, uh, from the raw data, and where they also look at the outperformance of companies with uh, different types of profitability or investment. And there are also many more uh, alternatives: uh, consumption capm, conditional capm, graph for factor matter. Yada, yada, yada. So uh, there are also a couple of links here if you want to dive deeper into these uh, extensions. Okay, so let's wrap this up. The key takeaways uh, are um, that this CAPM is a very simple equilibrium model in a frictionless economy. So it's uh, uh, investors really don't face any, any restrictions. And the result is that the investors in this model hold a mix of the market portfolio and the risk-free rate. And this, res this result can be used to describe the expected return of an individual stock as a linear function of its asset beta. And this beta is, can be interpreted as the sensitivity of a stock to market movements. Uh, and as I've shown you or hopefully convinced you is that this beta estimation can be done very simply in R by using linear regression and historical data that can be downloaded uh, easily. Uh, I just want to mention that I also provide a link to an app that I've built a couple of weeks ago, the Alpha Estimator app. There you can play around with different assets and different markets and you also have time varying betas and uh, uh, you can also look at uh, whether you your favorite asset has uh, alpha. And last but not least, I want to mention that the next webinar will somewhat build on stuff introduced by Farm and French, uh, because we will look at uh, company fundamentals and how you can analyze uh, diff and compare different companies using various financial ratios based on balance sheet and income statement information. So thank you very much for. Uh, attending and let's take a look whether we've received some questions. Um... Okay, so there was one question about the uh, links to the webinar and the slides. Um, I've mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation, if I quickly go back. So all slides and recordings of uh, the previous, uh, this webinar at talks.tidyfinance.org. And you can even find uh, a couple of different, so the slides of today, the video will also be linked here the slides for the previous uh, webinar, and also some other talks that we have given in the past. And I just want to mention that this, this uh, topic is very new. So um, it, we have not written this up to a chapter in the Tidy Finance book yet, but we will uh, most likely do this very soon uh, after we have finished the webinar series and um, derived a couple of new uh, introductory chapters. So this also means I'm uh, very much looking forward to any kind of feedback that you might also have uh, or share with me via LinkedIn or uh, by email and you can uh, find my, my um, contact details also on tidyfinance.org. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar here, Christoph. So if there are no more questions, then I guess we can stop here. And yeah, hopefully I can see everybody again 
uh, for the next webinar when we talk about more about company fundamental data and we will move away from the uh, from the uh, returns uh, and portfolio optimization stuff. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.